what you said is that do we even know how to be inclusive with people who look like us when we increase the ability for people to feel like they belong more than they currently do people will bring more to the table and productivity will inevitably increase inclusive inclusivity or inclusion leads to increased engagement and we can't go wrong if we meet core human needs Feeling connected is a core human need. And once the organizational culture is aligned with this, then we can add diversity in its forms to inclusion. Yes, that's basically what I was talking about um, adding inclusion first. And lots of people yeah. you know, look at the symptom of lack of diversity and try to address that symptom first by right. saying, oh, we should be going to Howard to recruit graduates or, or whatever, you know, versus um, what are the basic principles of helping people feel like they belong so that you don't have, you know, these stereotypical charts that we have all over the organizational space where you have the one Black employee coming in and then the various stages. I mean, it's happened so often that we have it in stages till yeah. the person is either marginalized in the organization or they leave, whether fired or they, they remove themselves. So, yeah. And um, the, the angle that you had brought it in, I thought was interesting because it, it spoke about inclusivity from the standpoint that um, it affects everybody and not just everybody from people who you can maybe on the epidermal level see, you know, um, a difference, but people who might look like, or you might consider are like you, and yeah. but they themselves may be having feelings of isolation or feeling siloed, um, and you don't even know it because uh, being inclusive is not part of the culture. It's not something that is, um, it's not, not there. And then the idea was kind of like, it sounded like the, the base of having that inclusive in culture, uh, inclusive culture was with empathy, right? The ability to start thinking about others outside yourself and start being in their position outside yourself. And um, that in itself lends to ensure that um, different, let's still call them categories of folks however they, um, they shape out, um, can all feel safe because they're people who are, are taking that initiative to be empathetic, to, to think um, of others beyond themselves. So I want you to, to, to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so I mean, if I were to start it at the very beginning, then whatever the beginning is, I think we, we all know that there is us and then there's them. Whoever the them are, you know, the, it's the uh, um, people in my family and then people who are not, right? And so we, we do this automatically. So the skill building that we all need, and, you know, in many ways we have it, uh, we just don't use it all the time, is how do we make them us? Hmm. And, and having that as a clear intention, because outside of it being a clear intention, then we're just waiting for it to happen by some organic means. Like, you know, I like... Uh, soccer and and they like soccer too so you know but but there is this basic way of finding out how to make the them us and if we can kind of have that as a clear i want to make them us right i know how to make them us and when i don't know i'll allow myself to be uncomfortable while i push on the boundaries of figuring out how to make them us you know, and so I use the analogy of the party because I didn't go to a lot of parties in high school. I didn't feel like I was part of the us, you know, the them or the us. Well, the us nerdy girls uh, versus the them party girls. Okay. Um, and um, not only that, but I, I just didn't feel like I fit for, for a variety of reasons. And if I did go to a party because I didn't feel like I fit and I stayed in the corner and I use that analogy a lot when I think it is not sufficient for people to be at the party. For You can say that you're inclusive because people are allowed at the party. But if you can't notice that people are at the party but not participating in the party, 
And if you don't have the skills for helping people participate in the party, then you're not really being inclusive, you know? So I, I kind of um, started there. And so empathy is a core capacity in understanding how to do that without having rules. Uh, but it, it is this kind of fundamental ability to notice that others exist that are not engaging in the party, in the whatever it is that we are engaging in. And then being curious about why and being empathetic enough to, to say, to reach out and to interact and to, to either bring the party to them because some aspects of inclusion are, let's take the party there. Yeah. Um, yeah. John's, in, John's in a wheelchair. He cannot climb Everest with us, the boys. It, we should not plan a trip to Everest if John is part of this team. Um, let's figure out what kinds of things that we could do together with John that John can also enjoy. So take the party there within whatever the confines are or figure out how to bring John into the party, you know, so. No, that's such, that's... Um... I love that analogy. I love that. Um, I remember actually being in, in college and because uh, um, when we were partying in, in Barbados, like when you came to party, everybody was party. It was dancing. Even when you went to a concert, it wasn't necessarily about the person who was singing. It's like right. everybody was just jamming. And right. so you would get that type when you would go, you would have, um, you might have like the Caribbean party at our house, right? Um, off campus and people would, comes through and then you know there are always people who um want to just kind of stand up on the wall type deal yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh when it, when i when we did a party we'd be like nobody this is oh, nobody, nobody on goes wall. off <laughs> nobody can be on the wall i used to go to the wall i bring everybody and be dancing and stuff like that and um and I, it that kind of really uh hit me because uh i i really like your statement of just because the person's at the party doesn't mean that they really still are involved, right? Even if they were invited. And you might say, well, they were invited, they're here, it's, it's up to them. Up to them, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the extra step of actually um, stepping out or, or actually seeing that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes being able to understand that maybe if this, this is their first, first semester at school or if they don't know anybody, they may not be, be comfortable, right? Um, they might not be in a space where they 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 want to step out, and so um, being able to to take those first steps um, uh, to me expresses leadership. To me, express expresses that 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 empathy. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that um, this idea, well, they're at the party, so if they want to participate, they will. Is a cop out. Um, yeah. It's it is the responsibility, as far as I'm concerned of the majority to include the minority, whoever the minority is. So that person who's leaning on the wall, I mean, needs to be over-invited. Like, hey, what's going on? Come on, man, let's go, come, come on. You know, and be annoying to communicate that, no, we really want you to be a part of us. Yeah, okay, yeah. honestly, if you really want to lean against the wall, all right, guys, come over here, let's all go, you know, because, because it's the, this kind of leaving it to whoever the minority is, the one girl, the one nerd, the one black person, the one person with autism, the one deaf person, the one person in the wheelchair, to leave it to that person to put themselves in the crowd goes against all of how humans are. Yeah. Like, the collective, the tribe, the village is what helps us feel safe. So automatically, if you're isolated, that's why isolation is a punishment. If you're isolated, you are at a disadvantage and you know it. So you have defensive mechanisms and you do all the things that you do because you are that person. But this whole, well, this person should put themselves in. You know, so we have all these conversations, uh, as I've been in a lot of these conversations about Black people in the workplace, Black women in the workplace and our voice and being, speaking up and being seen. Right. And, and yet there's the, uh, the other side of the conversation about, but it's dangerous. <laughs> you are already isolated. You are already the minority, the one, the two in the crowd or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so you know that you aren't safe just on the physiological level. And until there is this sense that you are part of the us, then this kind of, it's much, much harder. It doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of us overcoming that, right. but there is 
this acknowledgement of if you are in the minority, it is absolutely harder. And it is part of the responsibility of whoever majority is to include. So including is an act from the majority by just by definition, you know, so. Two, two words that, that come to mind, right? That I kind of marry together are discomfort and courage, mm -hmm. right? And how do you uh, take the, uh, the courage to go through that uncom uncomfortable situation, that discomfort to um, bring people to that place where they are a part of us? Now, I think it would take courage on, on both sides and I think there would be discomfort on both sides. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. It's uncomfortable on both sides. And it's like, it's, it's the, me the meeting ground for that discomfort is trust building, right? So... I think that um, as people who are custodians of spaces, like we are, we hold space for people. And whether you're the boss, the team leader or whatever it is, part of your responsibility, part of our responsibility is to build spaces where people can trust that when they're uncomfortable, um, it's not going to have repercussions that are massively negative and, and like they're not going to be hurt even though they're so that we can have the courage the whole thing of having courage in the face of discomfort and we don't want people to say okay i'm going to be courageous and if i die i die no that's not what we want in the workplace people have rent and mortgage and food and kids so this if i die i die that many we have to take on as advocates for change that's amazing but in the normal day-to-day -day workspace we have to be willing to explicitly say it's okay. The, the, I don't know. I have, if I'm the leader and I have a space that, that, that I'm trying to make more integrated and more inclusive and more diverse, I have to own my discomfort and say, hey, I, I, I have no idea. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I probably am complicit in all of this and so on. And I'm creating a space here where, you know, you can give me feedback. I want you to teach me the things that I make can, are triggering discomfort or, or whatever it is. I, I, I'm creating the space and it is safe for this conversation to happen. And of course, we aren't gonna trust off the top. So that trust is gonna have to be built and proven over and over again. And over time, both sides will become more vulnerable and more willing to kind of sit in the discomfort without massively protecting ourselves. Because I think it's as we move through that discomfort to the creation of solution, there is a co-creation of solution, but it's through the discomfort, right? And we have to be willing, it has to feel safe to stay there enough to say, okay, so what's really happening here? And then how do we create spaces that feel safe and feel like people belong and, you know, where, where we can um, understand each other truly on the deep level and we can reduce the triggers in the environment and other things, you know? So how do we do that? Okay, all right. So I do feel that, but we have to, in discomfort is a part of life. So the issue isn't the discomfort. It's about being willing to stay in the discomfort and not feel like I'm going to be hurt because of it. So Brené Brown brought up the, the power of vulnerability. And she mentioned that um, in order for you to have connection, right, real connection, the, the path is through vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned, one, you have to allow yourself to be seen. Mm -hmm. You know, love with your whole heart with no guarantee. And I think that's the big discomfort, right? That there's not going to be any reciprocation or you're going to do something and uh, it might blow up in your face. There's no guarantee. Right. Um, then she mentioned practice gratitude and joy. That, and then she said, um, and believe that I'm enough. Mm -hmm. And so that, and all these words tie in, but when you hear vulnerability, um, what, what does that say to you when it comes to um, making, making them us, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think one of the biggest, you know, the, the natural way that we make them us uh, is to find out what we have in common. Um, so, you know, like I, I use the soccer or the Olympics examples, printers or whatever, whatever the thing is that we get crazy about and we form a group around. The more vulnerable we are and the more we allow ourselves to be seen, the more possibility there is for us to see what we have in common. Mm. There is a whole common human experience that we're having. 
Possibly. our own hardship of all the things. So like when, when we're having the recent conversations about the racial um, issues and, and how it has felt to be black in America, the questions around people not understanding that have to do with that's not their experience. It's they're blind to it. It's just not, it's not their experience. Right. What is their experience is um, in other ways, how they have a thing that characterizes them, that they identify with, that's important to them, that's completely invisible to other people. And when we allow ourselves to be seen, so when I started to have the conversations about the fact that my son has autism and because my son has autism and I've been understanding myself to be, people don't understand that I don't sleep at nights. People don't under, because he does autism, people they don't sleep well. And the various aspects of, of being the parent of a child with special needs and how I understand that people don't know. P people think that if I say I didn't sleep last night and then I didn't tell you tonight, they're like, oh, you slept. People don't know that it's an ongoing experience. And so it's blind, they're blind to it. And so when I tell that story, I, I tell that story as a way to help people see that we all have things that other people are blind to. I make myself vulnerable. I share that. And then other people, I tend to just ask people, what, what's, what have you gone through that you wish other people had seen? And I've, been, I've done this with teams and, and had you know, women share about being in college and being cute and wishing that people took them seriously wishing that people thought, like just knowing that people thought they weren't smart or women who wore glasses and therefore had a stereotypical quote unquote nerd look, yeah. wish that people didn't assume. And so we have all these stories of invisibility, of things that are us that other people don't notice and move ahead and ignore. And the more vulnerable we are, the more we see the intersections in all our experiences, even though for me, it's about, you know, my, 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 my identity as a special needs mom. And for you, it might be about, you know, being from Barbados um, or, or whatever the thing is. And so that's, I, I really enjoy helping teams work on building trust through vulnerability because, because the human story connects us. And then we build trust through those stories. It's like, ah, I see what's going on. I had a conversation with a team once and the team leader shared, I asked everybody on the team, how do they, um, in what ways do they feel like they're not included? And people shared quite innocuous, you know, not nothing inflammatory, but is being on their good behavior. And the team leader said um, he wished that some of the difficult stories came to him directly. Instead, the difficult stories come to him through other people. Mm. They're filtered first, right? Yeah. And he then says, though, that he doesn't, he, it's hard for him to process uh, stories that come to him that are full of emotion. So when somebody comes to him to, exp to express something difficult and they're expressing it using a lot of emotional language and expression, it's hard for him to process that. And he also deals with a lot of anxiety. All of that together was such a vulnerable disclosure that helped create so much more understanding. Um, that probably is why, because it's hard for him to process this lots of emotion, uh, it's probably the reason why people may not come to him directly. But then just knowing that about him offers so much more compassion to the person who has the difficulty, right? And I, so I enjoy when I'm with teams kind of just, how do we disclose more in a space of trust where we're not gonna be, people aren't gonna take it and argue, talk about us behind our back. People aren't gonna take it and, and make our lives bad, difficult because of it. We're not gonna be punished because of it, but instead it becomes the currency for deeper understanding. That then creates the us. Cause like, oh, I understand what it feels like to have something expressed to me in a way that overwhelms the way my brain works. I understand that it's not with emotion, but it's with other things. And so I understand how then, then that creates a block and the need for both me and the other person to know that when we're in the dialogue so that we can both be translating together in a way that helps us come to a common understanding. Ah, I know that, I understand that feeling. B brings in the empathy, right. brings in the deeper trust, 
brings in the deeper communication and this general understanding that we're having a common human experience. So it's somewhat nerve wracking, right? Because um, you almost, you're thinking about maybe those, those, it might just be few whom, who may use that information um, in a, in a ne negative way, right? right? And, and sometimes it's, it's really something that you've probably played in your head more and therefore you're more sensitive to it. You right. know? And so, um, and, and I, I realized the, the path through that, even if you do get that, the response, that might be terrifying, whatever, it becomes freeing. You know, so it's almost like uh, the path through the vulnerability is a path to freedom, right? Is, is, a, is a path to kind of being um, released of those things, um, of those fears, of those, um, those different things that, that, that you were just kind of, that was on your shoulders, right? right. And so when it does happen and, and you get through it, it's like, it's, it's now um, it's, it's like like it's gone, and so um, so yeah. I, think, I, go ahead. I, mean, I agree that you know yes that going through it kind of helps us know that oh we didn't die right we didn't get, that thing that I'm carrying like I did, it was fine right yeah. I think also we can build communities where this becomes the norm. And part of this becoming the norm on your communities, it may not be the whole you know, town, the whole organization, the whole workplace, but you and your team, mm -hmm. or if we're using the workplace example, or in your family, you and your family, you and your click group, whatever it is, when we build these practices by modeling, because humans, we do so much in our us group by modeling for each other that once we agree that we are an us, and then we model a certain behavior, other people do it, you know? So within our family or within our little, whatever our collective is. So if we are willing to model vulnerability and have agreements around it for each other, even though we're going to have different levels of it, it won't be that bad. It won't be like, oh, and then people take it on top because we've had an agreement. And so we can build some muscles within these smaller groups. Yes. When it's uh, I'm talking from stage, I'm talking from a bigger to a bigger group that maybe don't have the same agreements as we have in our collective, then yes, there is that additional factor like Brene on the TED stage. Right, right. But I think we need to be willing to practice these in our communities, in our spaces, especially the spaces where we have influence, because then we are modeling this, um, you know, just as a way of being in the world. So it sounds like if you're um, talking about building a framework of trust, so that within that, um, um, you then you or you then you can create that um, that model that you're talking about, right? So because at the end of the day, um, you do have to feel some sense, or you have to take that step of faith to believe that there's trust here, that this is a place that. Um, I can be vulnerable to a certain extent. And you mentioned before that um, sometimes it's the job of the, the majority to do these things or it, and, and it might not be the majority in, in a way that you think. It could be the majority, it could be the person who's more bold to be vulnerable, right? The person who's been through this before, right? Um, they might be quote unquote, a minority in some way, but they've been through this path and so now they want to make sure that they build up a framework where that where other people can feel like, okay, look, um, let me walk you over, you know, the this 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 path of coals or whatever to get to the other side. And right. so, um, how do you build that um, that trust framework? Mm -hmm. So I think that if, I'm going to talk about the you that's the leader because I think uh, you know when we said majority, I think a better word there is the person of influence. Because I've, I remember being at a conference with, who, I don't remember her name, but she was a Nigerian American woman um, named in the top 40 under 40, really influential. I think she had worked for 
Facebook at one point or, or anyway, it's just very influential in branding and marketing and stuff. And she, as a black woman, she, and she's tall and then she wears heels. So she's towering <laughs> and you know, she's bold in our colors. And, and she says, when I come to the table, you have to notice me. And when you notice me, I say, so, and she points to another person. So, so-and-so, what do you have to say? Or, you know, so she, it, she, she uses the fact that she has influence really strongly to bring people to the table. And I think that part of the responsibility of anybody who has influence in any space is to use that influence to build the framework work of trust by first modeling it. So I think fundamentally, number one is to model it. Number two is to um, ask for agreement around it. Um, so model the vulnerability. When we ask for agreements that we're not willing to live in, then people don't trust us. So model vulnerability and ask for agreement, set, set the space up as a safe space. What we're gonna do here is I have an open door. We can talk about these things. For example, for me, I don't feel included when, or I don't understand how to, or I may be messing this up or express the vulnerability and ask for um, the agreement around the vulnerability. And then number three, really be a good student of yourself and notice when you feel like you might want to use this against another person. We have to be, we have to be good students of ourselves. And when we're good students of ourselves and be willing to learn from our own experience that we can kind of turn that around and say, oh, this is the kind of thing that I am using to judge this person. What would I want to do differently? How can this situation be more healthy? Have a mentor, have a person that we're reflecting that back to. It's like, now that I've made this shift, this is what I noticed that I am at risk here, or I may be more biased here. Because as we make these decisions and our biases and stuff are going to show up. So have a person that you can disclose this to in a safe way. And then once you've thought it through, also bring that back to the team. Whoa, this process has really been interesting for me because it's helping me to notice some of my biases. And, you know, so I noticed that blah, blah, blah. And, and, and be willing to, again, be that model for it. So I think that's how we establish trust by showing it. And right now, trust is a thing that's hard to build now in this moment in time that we're in. So we have to be willing to kind of say, I'm willing to be vulnerable and allow the trust building to happen by moving ahead, you know, just like moving ahead with uh, this is the way we need to be, even though it's uncomfortable. And I think that part of, I'm trying to pull together some um, content on the ROI of inclusion, the return on investments on inclusion, because I think that when we think it's a freely add-on, then we can say, well, we'll figure it out sometime. But what we don't understand is that we're actually leaving money on the table because, you know, in the workplace, people are less than 50% engaged, especially now with social media and all this kind of thing. Engagement is down. Um, people are producing at the levels they're producing while being less than 50% engaged. And so my first question just from... I believe we should meet human needs. I absolutely believe we should meet human needs. But if, if, if CEOs and organizational leaders aren't interested in meeting human needs, half of the money that we're paying in salaries is being wasted because people are only half engaged. I wonder what would happen if people were just even, even 70 or 80% engaged. And how, how do we know that people can be 70 or 80% engaged? Because these people are actually engaged in passion projects outside of work where money is not involved, but they actually feel like they belong and they feel they have meaning. They have, you know, they're on mission. They're excited about it, whatever the thing is, whether it's sports or it's digging a well or doing something else, right? So when people feel like they belong, they become more engaged, their productivity ratchets up. And some of these same people, what they're accomplishing in 40 hours at work and 50 hours at work, they're accomplishing in 10 hours on a passion project outside of work. And so we have to consider how much more productive we could be while satisfying human needs. People would be happier, more engaged, well-being would go up, people would be less sick, there would be less COVID. But anyway, if we actually built spaces where people feel like they belong. Yeah. And of course, the quality of our decision making would go up and all the things. So it's not a soft thing. There is so much value to be gained. So yes, I will have to walk through some coals of fire if I'm going to be a person who models vulnerability. But it's worth it to me and my growth. It's worth it to my team. 
it's worth it to our organizational and mission, our goals. Okay. I wonder, are there any um, data statistics around uh, engagement, right? And uh, I wonder if there's anyone has done a study on that. Um, like you mentioned, uh, 50%, uh, people are like 50% engaged. I wonder if that's, um, there's some, some studies behind that or, or no, I'm not sure if you know, just, just wondering. I don't have the names of actual studies, but there are definitely studies behind it. And some of the studies are in different uh, specific organizational demographics. So it just depends. Um, there's one that I saw that basically said that um, they were comparing and they were talking about diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, and in this particular type of organization, then they measure that inclusion without diversity increased organizational, uh, increased workforce engagement by 70%. So it almost doubled. In inclusion without diversity? Okay. Inclusion without diversity, increased engagement by, um, by 70%. Okay. And in that particular study, what they also saw is that diversity without inclusion didn't have the same return. It increased engagement, but it increased it by a much smaller amount. And then diversity and inclusion was more than double. And so, you know, it was interesting just to say that when we were able to build in and sustain practices where people feel like they are a part of the whole and people, inclusion, one of the, one of the um, scientists that done a lot of work on inclusion um, through this thing called stereotype stress, which I love, I'm a little nerdy myself, um, Claude Steele, Claude Steele defines inclu feeling included as feeling grateful that you're a part of the whole and feeling like the whole is a place you can thrive. So you feel, you, you feel like you're included when you feel grateful to be a part of it and you feel like you can grow and thrive and it's healthy for you, right? Mm. And so when that's happening, then they are seeing engagement almost doubling. Brene Brown again was saying, like when you're going to, for connection, sometimes when you want to take a shortcut, Mm -hmm. Not go through that um, vulnerability, right? Right. Uh, not take those, not go through discomfort, not take those courageous steps. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That she mentioned that we sometimes numb ourselves, mm -hmm. um, which then, and what we do in one area can, you know, um, affect other areas. So that uh, then includes numbing your, your joy, your love, your creativity, adventure, etc. Um but then she said something else that was pretty, uh, that struck me. She said, we make the uncertain certain, mm. right? So now um, her, her, so she was basically saying that then you move into um, um, a position of blame, that you blame away um, to this charge, you kind of point fingers, all that sort of stuff. Um, she, was, she, was, she was talking also like, um, she was mentioning in, in the political arena, right? People no longer have any real civil discourse. It's more shouting, shouting, shouting. I am completely right. You're completely wrong. The other side is the same thing, right? I'm completely right. You're completely wrong. They're, they're absolutely certain, right? Because the path down that hill to kind of meet and actually have that conversation, right? The, the, the fact that you might agree with some points or, you know, give a little, that might be just too much, you know? Yeah. So you, you, you stay on just being certain. So it, it breaks the opportunity for, for real uh, connection. So um, have you seen that, right? Where, where you kind of, um, have you seen an example like that where you just kind of want to stay firm, you want to stay certain um, and, and, do you see that as part of, like she says, of, of not wanting to of be vulnerable? Yeah, where I've seen that is in the silos. You know, so what you see happening a lot in workspaces is, is while the collective space isn't um, safe, so it's not inclusive, it therefore isn't safe. So, so you find in that collective space, you don't even have good, healthy conflict. You don't, you may even have no conflict. You just have, you know, people showing up at meetings and people kind of doing their own thing. What you find is that those same people form little silos. Mm -hmm. Within the silo, there's pretty 
firm boundaries, pretty firm walls. We believe this, he is an idiot, or we believe that, you know, and, and so you, and then you have the true information, but only relevance to the one point of view happening there. So the team does not have access to, or the workspace doesn't have access to everybody's collective wisdom because you don't have access to any individual's deep wisdom, but the silo does. But unfortunately, the silo only has access to wisdom on one perspective. And so you have that all locked in there and it, it becomes, you know, a reinforced us against them type of situation, which doesn't create healthiness for work. And so, you know, when I, I, I used to, I, back in the day, I thought I was going to become a doctor. So I did all the biology, all the zoology. And so when I think about uh, vulnerability, I think about the semi-permeable cell membrane, this, this membrane where things pass in and out. And I think of a silo, on the other hand, as something that has does not have a semi-permeable membrane. Things are not passing in and out. What's in is in, and what's out is out. And I think to, to create the us, it has to be that we allow things in and out. So that, so that, yes, I know what I think, what I believe, it feels clear and strong to me. And I'm willing to have stuff come in and out that's from other points of views that I can take and like reflect on. And then there is also the common space in between where all of this kind of comes together to create its own whole. And so I think of it like a mosaic or I think of it like crochet or macrame where you have several threads coming together to create its own separate thing. And that's part of what we have to be willing to do. It's a stew. You know, you're creating a, a completely different but integrated thing versus we have fish, we have vegetables, we have rice, you know? And so, um, so it is about vulnerability for me in terms of the willingness to bring that barrier down and the risks associated. You let stuff in that feels toxic. You let stuff in that really shakes your foundation and you don't have the skills or the tools to say, I don't know what this means. Lots of times the certainty comes from fear. Like, wait, if I, if I feel like we are so binary, right? We're very like, it's this or that in, in so much of our thinking that, and we do have to, um, I believe that to move forward as humans, we have to be willing to let go of binary thinking that it really is not this or that. It's both and 15 other things at the same time, things that we don't know about yet. And yeah. so um, part of this, it, the holding on to the position is the fear because we think in such binary ways that, if I agree with this small thing, it means I'm letting go of that thing. And I can't afford to let go of that thing because my identity is tied up in that thing. And yeah. what am I going to do? And it's just like, oh, no. And you just lock in. You know, it's like, you know, like the fights that people have in all relationships. And like when we can actually acknowledge that I can hold on to my thing and understand your thing and even acknowledge that I may change my mind about an aspect of what I think and that does not uh break my my identity you know yeah yeah um that's a, um that's a powerful conversation in itself uh um yeah wanting to hold on to that um identity um the way we are in any space i think we had said this and it's been coming back to me a lot the, the way we are in any space in, in one space reflects the way we are in any space right yeah we spend eight to 10 hours at work. Um, likely the ways that we're being there is also showing up in our personal relationships and our relationships with our kids, like in, in all of the ways that we are with people. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it's worthwhile kind of putting the magnifying glass on something that feels less risky, like the fact that this person is ticking you off to the point where you're really planting your flag. I believe this, this person is wrong. You really, this, this is a hill I'm going to die on around, you know, file such and such and document so-and-so, right? I'm going to, when we're doing that, what's that saying about, about the way we are in the other spaces? Um, because, the, but I come back to some of these things when I think about inclusivity, inclusive behaviors, that if we can learn these behaviors in any space, we can translate them into every space. Um, it's, it, if we're not doing them at work, we're not doing them at home either. We're not doing them with our kids. We're not doing them with our partners. We're just not doing them. Right. 
So it's it's worth it to kind of let those things be magnifiers for us. And so I think um, I think that one of one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is that we we in, in on this the topic for me is like how do we how do we help each other to think and act together and create together is really the topic for me. And um, if I use like sports as an analogy. When sports teams, like soccer teams, football, whatever the team is, when they come together and they're training together, they watch videos of plays. They watch, um, they watch how, what does effective teamwork look like? They yeah. watch, right? I think that in many of our spaces, we don't have any mental movies of what this could look like if it was done well. And, and so part of what I've been encouraging myself with and I'm, enco I'm encouraging people as I talk with them with is let's imagine what this done well looks like. What does, what does inclusion actually look like? Not just the end result of, you know, 30% black or whatever you've decided right. it is, but what does this look like in the day to day and, and really um, create movies that you and your people can rehearse together. I think when we know what it's supposed to look and feel like, then it's easier for us to shift ourselves around so we move towards that. And yeah, look at, look at the end goal and basically uh, work back from there. And, and that's uh, a strategy that many people use in business and other aspects of their life. So um, I think that's, that's a great point. Adding it as a behavioral thing, because the end goal that we look at in business tends to be the measurable, like what's the, what's the, you know, how many X's are we trying to do by the end of the quarter? And I'm like, this is great. Uh, how, well, what this is, is measurable too, right? Because um, I, I mean, I really like your point there, because I do think to a certain extent, um, people still feel like the topic might be somewhat vague. You know, how do I know that I'm, I'm hitting the mark almost? And, and many people might be built like that. Like, I want to hit the mark. Okay, I'm, I'm setting on this course and I'm going full force. And then when they realize they don't, things get diffused. And sometimes I get concerned about that because I wonder if, you know, because I do feel like if people are going to, I really uh, believe that people are tr seeking to lean in. People are seeking to make an effort, right? Um, and... And, and then doing that and then wondering, well, did I really get anywhere with this? Did I, did we really move forward? Um, because of the fact that they didn't really have that end goal. They didn't really know what that mark was. They don't, they didn't really know um, what achievement was on it. Um, it becomes a little bit frustrating. And so right. your, what you just said to me is, is, um, is seriously uh, important because it gives people um, something to, to go after, right? And even that end goal can then, you can have some milestones after that, right? Because we're all growing. So we might say, well, I'm not there right now, but I am moving towards this path and I know why I'm doing this. And so I, I, I thought that point was that, was, that was excellent, yeah. Yeah, and I think that when that end goal needs to be both measurable in terms of the ways we measure, Mm -hmm. and needs to be visual okay. so that we are moving our bodies yeah. because inclusion is an embodied thing, right? There's a way we need to act. How does it look? How does it yeah. feel? How does it look? And, you know, like one of the ways it looks is um, all the way out there and our retention is higher. But right. what does it look like coming in a little bit? Then people's kind of discomfort after the hiring what does that discomfort look like? And what do we want it to look like? Oh, people start asking questions in meetings. Oh, so the behavior of being silent in a meeting is a behavior we don't want. And when people are actually asking questions and talking in meetings, that's what it looks like. Okay, so let's have some movies of what engagement looks like and inclusion looks like in our minds. So you can be in a meeting and then not be asking the question you're asking, am I hitting the mark? You'll know, cause you're in a meeting and you're like, yes, people are talking. Yes, there's conflict, but people are not vexed. People are not leaving the meeting and saying, oh, this meeting was so long. No, I know I'm hitting the mark. Even though we haven't gotten to the point yet of whatever the ROI is on the end. I know I'm hitting the mark for this meeting. Yeah. People feel included like, and they're like they belong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I love it. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, there's some words that I listen to you, and it kind of 
uh, makes me go, okay, I need to ask about that. So you mentioned the word conflict again, right? And um, to me, um, conflict can be a, a good thing, right? I, I felt like I grew up in, in, a, in a household and around a family that um, I guess arguing was actually a good thing, you know? And if, if, if somebody didn't, if you didn't have that discourse, you know, um, you didn't feel as uh, as intimate. <laughs> so um, to me, that word conflict, I, I feel like if it needs that, um, what was it, you know, iron, sharpening iron, that you're going to get that. So how, how would you talk about conflict in this whole uh, situation? Well, conflict is just, I have you and I. So. conflict is just you and I having different opinions, right? right. Okay. Um, so conflict is good because through conflict is that third or fourth or fifth thing that really is the thing that um, capitalizing on, uh, capitalizes on both our wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, but it's then when we don't know how to, um, not how to argue well, mm -hmm. how to take it personally and not to see it as an attack and all the various things. And then that's when I think it's difficult. And we all have uh, residual things that can be triggered when there's conflict. Like I have beliefs around not being liked and, and being seen as too domineering and other things like that. And so if I say, hey, this is what I think, and then you say something, I'm like, oh my goodness, you think, I think, and I have my whole internal dialogue that goes on that makes You're it You're already hard. going down that path already. <laughs> A whole, a whole thing that makes it hard. So then when next I speak, I may be using a more measured tone uh, right. because I'm moderating my own self. And then you take that to me and I'm being cynical and sarcastic. And then we have a whole thing. Oh my gosh. Right? And so it's more about my self-studentship. Oh, wow. This thing is triggering a thing in me. Ah, I should, let me, let me make a note of that because I need to do some work on that, right? And what's going on here? Why when Vernon says this, this thing happens, right? And I need to grab that and bracket it while knowing that the nature of conflict is important. And if it is that we can't have something valuable happening in the conflict, then we need to be willing to say, hey, look, I'm being triggered by something here. So let's pause this because we really do need to have this conversation. So let's pause this. Um, and can we get back to it on blah, blah, blah. In the meantime, do you think make it, it makes sense for us to email? Um, I, I, I don't, I want to hear what you have to say. This feels really, really important. This is nothing to do with you. I have some stuff going on, whatever it is. I have to learn some skills to know, manage my own self, handle my business and still hear from you. But what we've seen is that when we're, when we, we don't want to do that, it's very uncomfortable in the workspace. It feels unsafe. Maybe I'll get fired if I have conflict with the wrong person, you know, the one that's in and I'm out and all the things. So then what we find is there's no conflict and no conflict is always bad. If I go into a meeting and people are all quiet and, and the team leader or whoever says a bunch of stuff and everybody says, okay, it's okay, okay, okay. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> this, is a, this is awful. You don't, that means engagement is down. That means you don't have the wisdom of the team. This is terrible. So we have to be willing to kind of work through to the point where it's messy. And then when it's messy, then we learn the skills to be able to harness the wisdom the right way. We move through messy to the point where, okay, we can, we can have conflict and then we sort it out and we leave with more knowledge than we had before. Yeah. This is so real, yeah. Um... Uh, and as you were as you were talking and painting that picture, I was like, uh, "That's what she's talking about." Being able to see that that movie, being because um, that was so um, that was so real. I feel like it's, it's good when like you thought you know this would be a great conversation, and then you have that conversation, and the conversation is even greater. I feel good about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? It makes me feel. Um, somebody said on LinkedIn. Um, just this week, uh, I don't even know why I came across the video, but she said, you know, um, it should be a hell no or a hell yes, yeah. basically, right? And so I hadn't heard that term before, but, you know, she was basically saying, you know, sometimes you're, 
you're just doing stuff, um, what are the things that you would really say hell yes to? And um, this, this was like two days ago. And I was like, I would say hell yes to a conversation with Faith. And, uh, and, I, was, and I was happy that I had that conversation. Like seriously, I was like, I'm happy that I have this conversation on my calendar, right? And so, I mean, even if we didn't do the video and everything like that, because I felt like if um, it brings a lot of, a lot of the things that I'm thinking about that I'm trying to articulate, that I'm seeking to understand and learn, um, you're, you're bringing it right there. And so it just, uh, it, it felt good. And this was a hell yes for my week. So I okay. really appreciate it. I kind of lean into that too. Like, like, like this kind of maybe any, anything that feels all right. It's like, we don't have the time for that anymore, you know? And so can I allow myself to let go of some of that? That's just also been the almost like it's a growth opportunity for all of us, you know. So yeah, nah, yeah. And, and I and I agree that um, you know in the Bible it talks about you know being lukewarm, and um, to a certain extent, uh, you know we're we're putting out a lot of energy whether we think it is or not, right? And many times we're putting out a lot of energy just doing things that we know to do or part of our pattern you know, a habit or whatever. And, or, you know, or we just learn to put up with, you know, cope, whatever. And um, when she mentioned that the fact of hell yes, because I've heard people talk about saying no, right? And I understand that too. But when she mentioned saying hell yes, do they, and then I thought to myself, what are things that you will say hell yes to? Yeah. You know? Um, because I think I've heard the conversation more of, you know, you know, you live your life and learn how to say no. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes you have to create those hell yeses. Yep, yep, yep. yep. You know what I mean? And, um, and, and that takes a little bit more uh, inside uh, conversation, you know, really ask yourself, what do you want? What would you like to achieve? What would you like to do? What would you like to experience? What would you like to be a part of? How would you like to share? You know, all those type of things. What would you say hell yes to? And um, and I do realize that sometimes the reason why we're all in those medium grounds because we don't really take that time to to go like what, you know, like when you're really busy and you're really productive, it's easier to say no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so one of the reasons why you might not be saying no is because you just don't have the hell yes is there. And yeah. so. And I think that you may have decided this is what I want and then don't have the courage to like, okay, you're right. So then you're like, yeah. ah, you back off and go off, go off the mediocre, easy, you know, lukewarm, but don't take any courage. Don't take any, you know, and so, but yeah, just yeah. creating that as a really good word to use because of deciding that I'm going to step into that, tell yes, that. Yeah. Uh, I have taken the time to hear that I want. Mm -hmm. and then I'm walking away from it because I'm like, <laughs> you know, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. 